Thank you. So hello everyone, thank you very much for uh, coming this afternoon. I hope you've had an exciting day so far and we have an hour this afternoon to talk about reasonable adjustment. And I've actually titled this um, presentation when reasonable adjustment becomes unreasonable because that is in fact what we see the majority of the time uh, in the vet sector. And it's not because you're not adjusting things, it's because you're over adjusting things. So the idea of our session this afternoon is that we look at this concept of reasonable adjustment, see how it actually should be working and the kind of process that you should be going through as an RTO to make sure that reasonable, adjust reasonable adjustment uh, works well in your organisation. So my plan is certainly not to talk at you for an hour. We have um, some handouts and some exercises that we are going to do. Uh, we will do them as a group. The people who are joining us via webinar might actually be doing them by themselves or if you're in a group, you'll be able to do them uh, as a group. So you've got a few handouts on the desk that's in front of you. Uh, these two handouts are the ones that we will be using for the exercises. So you have a process checklist that you can take away and uh, use yourselves. And we have a case study that we'll be working through. The two sets of units that are sitting on the desk are for you to use in that case study exercise. And the people who are joining us via webinar, I believe those documents have been um, emailed through to you today. Okay, so when we think about reasonable adjustment, what often happens is we think about equality. But really what we should be thinking about is equity. And I think this diagram shows really nicely what the difference between those two things are. So in this case, the outcome of actually being able to see over the fence is what we want to achieve. And it's the way we get to that outcome that we are going to adjust. So we're looking for setting up equitable processes in our RTO to make sure that any student who comes to us can actually achieve the outcome or has the opportunity to achieve the outcome. So the outcome is fixed, but the way we get there can be variable. And that's a really important thing to understand. The outcome is fixed, but the way we can get there can be variable. So there are a lot of documents that sit out there around uh, reasonable adjustment and the reality is the definitions that sit in those documents differ a little bit. So we're going to deal with a few of them. <coughs> so this is the definition uh, that comes out of this book. Okay. So it talks about reasonable adjustment um, as being a modification that's been made to the learning environment to certification requirements, to training delivery or assessment methods, to actually help the learners with a disability access and participate in education and training on the same basis as those without disability. Now there are times when we will also make reasonable adjustments for people who have no disability. So it is a generalised process that we can use within our organisation, but a lot of the literature that exists in the process exists focused on, on disability. So there's actually a set of uh, standards that guide what we do here. That's these ones. Now, the link uh, to this is in the PowerPoint presentation, which you'll be able to um, access, I believe, after the session. So these are standards. Uh, it's a piece of legislation that actually says what adjustment uh, is. And it talks about the, a measure or action that we take as an organisation. So it's whatever it is we do to actually enable that participation. And those things that we do can be scattered throughout the teaching and learning process. So for example, we might be doing uh, things in relation to um, enrolment. We might in fact be making changes around admission processes. We might be making changes around um, the support 
process that's, that we provide uh, to an individual who is studying with us. We might make adjustments to the facilities and resources that we're actually using for the teaching, learning and assessment process. And there are times where we'll also make adjust adjustments to the actual assessment itself. Because we work in an assessment-based system, a lot of the information that's actually available to us as RTOs is focused on assessment. But in fact, these measures or actions that we can take, in fact, sit throughout the, the time in which a student or a learner might engage with us. So it can sit across, what you do can sit across a whole range of processes within your organisation. And then they start to use the term reasonable and we say, well, what does it mean when something is actually reasonable? So reasonable is actually defined as <coughs> that it actually addresses the interests of the student in terms of what their disability is. That the views of the student or their associate, because sometimes you'll have an associate representing the student, have actually been taken into account. Um, that the effect of the, of the adjustment on the student actually helps them achieve uh, the learning outcomes, that it helps them participate in the process, and that in fact encourages independence. Reasonable is also about the effect that that proposed adjustment might have on other people who are involved in the process. So they're also talking about the staff of the RTO and the other learners who are engaged in that program. And the costs and benefits of actually making that adjustment. So there are going to be situations that when you have a look at that list of things, you might look at a proposed adjustment and say, this is actually unreasonable because it might be impacting adversely other people or the cost or the individual <coughs> themselves. So you can have a range of proposed adjustments and then it's up to us to figure out whether they are reasonable or not. And there's a very important statement in here which actually says, um, when you're assessing that adjustment, you have to decide whether that adjustment that adjustment actually maintains the academic integrity of the qualification that you're offering. And if it does not maintain the academic integrity of that qualification, then you do not have to make it. So that's the statement that I was making about the outcome earlier, that we are not to compromise the outcome of the qualification that we are delivering and assessing against. That is not what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is enable the participation. So when you're thinking about the things that you would then do as an RTO, then there's actually a kind of a process that you need to go through to figure out whether what you might be doing is an appropriate adjustment, is reasonable, and can be implemented. This document, the Disability Standards for Education 2005, is a very, very readable document. And there's a lot of guidance in here about what you can do as a training organisation and the steps that you might need to go through. Now I've simplified a lot of this information and popped it into the handout that we'll be using today, but it's well worth you downloading a copy of this and having a read of it. If for no other reason, other than it's very good for you to know the rules. So when you have a look at the standards for RTOs, they remain almost, well they are silent in fact, on reasonable adjustment. So they simply talk about the assessment process and you're putting an assessment process in place that's going to meet the, re the requirements of the training package and the principles of assessment and rules of evidence. And then there's another standard that says when you're putting a strategy in place, you make sure that it meets the needs of the individual learner. But what process you might go through to actually achieve those outcomes is never mentioned. So then it becomes up to you to actually understand this legislation and your students enough that you can actually do those things. So if you haven't got that message already, please, please, please. 
download these standards and read them. There is also a chapter in the uh, assessment publication that the department's put out, it's chapter four, which is also about reasonable adjustment. And there are some examples and case studies sitting in this document that might help you um, with ideas about what you could do. There are um, a range of materials that are available to you once you actually start delving into what uh, you could do in terms of reasonable adjustment. There is a fabulous resource that's on the University of Canberra's website, um, which is called A Practical Guide for Individuals, Families and Communities. Uh, and it's about adjustment, how you make adjustment. And it's actually an online uh, guide which you can navigate through. It has a lot of case studies and it has a lot of links to, uh, to other things that can help you as well. So if you were to Google search the Education Standards of 2005, that will come up about second or third on the list. So have a look at the guidance that's actually available out there to help you think about the process that you might uh, go through, which <coughs> will generally involve four steps. So you will go through a planning process where you think about what's possible for you to do in regards to reasonable adjustment. Then you'll go through a process of implementing what you planned. In there, there'll be a monitoring aspect, so you will watch to make sure that the things that you put in place are in fact working, and if not, how you might adjust them. And then there's some record keeping that you actually need to do to meet that piece of legislation, as well as um, the SRTOs. So those four steps are what we have included in this process sheet. So let's have a look at that now. Okay, so planning for the adjustment. So when you think about what you might do in a planning process, the first thing really is to understand what the issue is. So you really need to understand what the disability or issue is for the learner and what impact that might then have on the learner. So for example, if I uh, have had um, a, a brain injury, for example, that um, prevents me from concentrating, I need to understand what that is so that I can then think about how I might adjust the teaching and learning process to help me with that. If um, maybe I have um, some kind of visual impairment, then I need to understand to what degree that impacts on me as a learner so that I can plan what I might do and how I might be able to adjust and, and help that learner. So the first thing you need to do is, of course, get information about what the disability is and what impact that has on the individual who has the disability or the issue. Once you understand that, you're able to think about what impact that will then have on your teaching, learning and assessment process. So whoever is going through this planning process needs to understand how that teaching, learning and assessment is going to actually happen. So they're going to need some information about uh, the teaching process, about the materials that you're going to use, how the courses are structured, how the assessment happens, so that they can think about what needs to be adjusted through each of those places. So in a lot of these instances, we are relying on the person who has a disability or issue self-identifying for us and self-identifying early enough that we can actually start this planning process. And of course, there's going to be situations where that doesn't happen. Where it does happen, this can kick in straight away. You're going to think about what potential adjustments you could make to the teaching and learning uh, process. And it's really useful for you here to consult with some other agencies as well. So there are many, many organisations, um, both state-based and federally, that are able to provide you assistance when you're thinking about adjustments that can be made for different disabilities. So, for example, um, the Equal Opportunity Commission has got some great resources available about how you can make adjustments. Um, in South Australia, they have a fabulous tool that actually looks at uh, disabilities and how that 
they impact on the individual and what kinds of things happen in a workplace. Um, there are also specific agencies related to particular types of disability who will be able to provide you with information about things that can, um, can be done to help, to help individuals with those disabilities, both in the teaching and learning process and in the workplace once they have finished um, a qualification. The next step, and this is the step that lots of RTOs don't do, is checking whether the adjustments that you're planning to make are actually allowable within the rules that sit in the units of competency. So many, many times with the best of intent, what happens is you make adjustments to help an individual, but you actually break the rules of the unit of competency in terms of what the assessment requirements are, um, and, and that's where we've tipped over to, into that unreasonable idea. So, assuming that the adjustments are allowable within the rules from the unit of competency, we're then going to have a look at um, whether the adjustments that you might make in the training environment might also be adjustments that are able to be made in a workplace. So potentially you will be having to engage with employers uh, here because it's no point really adjusting things in a training environment if those adjustments can't be made and are not viable in a workplace. You need to know that this is something that could be carried through. Once you have all of that information, you have the opportunity to then make a decision about what you're, going to, what you're actually going to do. So what adjustments are you going to implement? What adjustments are you not going to implement? And you'll inform the learner about what your decision is around those adjustments. Uh, and finally, if you're making any changes to uh, any materials that you're using that might be commercial materials, you just also need to check whether you're going to infringe any copyright laws by making those changes. So throughout that process, the reality is that consultation has to happen. And these aren't decisions and information that you're going to make all by yourself. So consulting with the learner or the potential learner for your organisation is really important throughout this process. And when you have a look at those steps, there's more than half of those which would make no sense to do by yourself. Then in fact you should be doing them with the learner themselves because that's where the, the interest lies. Okay, so that consultation process has to be embedded in what you do when you're finding out information to answer these questions. So depending upon the kind of RTO that you come from, you might be the trainer and assessor who's doing all of this. You might be in a bigger organisation that actually has a team of people in place who might actually go through this process for you. But irrespective of that, these are the steps that you really need to have considered. When it comes to um, implementing the adjustments, you actually need a little bit of time to, to go through and do that. So if you're changing the, the teaching and learning assessment materials, you need to actually make those adjustments. And then we put our RTO hats back on and we say, you better make sure you validate those before you use them. Then you're going to discuss the implementation of that with the learner, make sure that they understand clearly what it is that's going to happen. If there is a workplace involved in the, in the teaching and learning assessment process, again, you would discuss these changes with the workplace, make sure they understand what's going to happen. Um, and you need to make sure that you f have figured out how you're going to monitor whether this is effective or not. And this is the kind of thing that you will often think about up front rather than halfway down the track going, oh, we better check whether this is working or not. So up front, at what points are you going to check and how are you going to check that these adjustments that you've made are working for the learner? Obviously you're going to talk to the trainer and assessor about this and it might be you who's making these decisions and then you're going to do whatever it is that you've planned to do. So monitoring and reporting sits on the next page. So monitoring, 
you're just going to track the progress at those monitoring points that you have agreed with, with the learner. And the idea is that you make sure that you've got some really nice, clear, simple mechanisms in place to enable communication between all parties. Okay, so you might think things are going to work, they might not be working for the learner, they might not be working for the cohort that they're in the class with, they might not be working for the trainer and assessor. So there's got to be some open communication channels to allow everybody to feedback. Depending upon what kind of information you get back through that monitoring, you might then adjust the adjustments so that you make sure that they're working. And of course, if you're going to make adjustments to what you are doing, then you would go back and check off on those planning points again. And in terms of recording, you have to record uh, the decisions that you've made and your advice to the learner about the adjustments. That's one of the requirements of that piece of legislation. You're going to record um, the results and changes or adjustments to the plan that you're putting into place. And you're also going to make sure that you include any assessment that has been adjusted in your validation sample. Okay. So as a process, I think it's pretty logical the things that, that you would do. So let's then look at this exercise, this case study um, that we have, to see how this might um, look in, in practice. So what you have here is a case study um, about Claire, who's working with a mining company and has uh, got a promotion within that company. And what that is meaning is that she has to engage in some training assessment. And Claire has um, issues with reading and writing. And she's going to go into a management role. So the RTO that this mining company is working with has got some ideas around how they're going to adjust the assessment for Claire. And those, uh, oh, that information is sitting in this case study. So there's two units that we're going to have a look at. The first one is a lead effective workplace relationships. And the second one is implement continuous improvement. And the information that you have there tells you what the original assessment is and what the RTO plans to do as an adjustment for Claire. Now, on your desks, I've given you a copy of both of those units. So you've got the unit of competency and you've got the assessment requirements for both of those units. Now, we're not going to be able to do all of these questions, but there's... Um, a few of them that I think as a group, and I would suggest that you divide your groups into two or you work on this, uh, this together. In the planning part of it, certainly the um, first few questions up to are the potential adjustments allowable when you consider the requirements of the unit are questions that I think you're going to be able to answer from the information that you have got in front of you. And what I want you to do is to get to a point where you can say, is the decision that the RTO has taken to adjust the assessment reasonable or not? If it is reasonable, why do you agree with the adjustments that they're going to make? And if it is unreasonable, why do you disagree with the adjustments that they're going to make? And I think it will take you potentially 15 to 20 minutes to do that. Okay, so I'm going to set you on that task. And if you've got questions as we go, then please stick your hand up and I'll come and answer them. I think most people have decisions now about whether they think those adjustments are reasonable or unreasonable. And that's what I'm going to ask you to share as soon as all of our ears have stopped hurting. Okay, so... The first unit, which was um, Lead Effective Workplace Relationships. Do we have a table that wants to volunteer to give us their decision? 
So if you don't volunteer, I'm just going to pick you. So <laughs> that's best to volunteer. Yes, yes. fabulous. Are we going to have a microphone? So what's your decision for the unit lead effective workplace relationships? Uh, we said yes, that that's fine, the adjustments, mm -hmm. because the requirements, there was a, a tiny bit of reading, which we felt was covered. Um, mm -hmm. There was no real requirement for writing, and so we felt that the verbalisation would be fine. Okay. And what about the other groups? Agree or disagree? Agree. Anyone disagree? Okay. Tell us why you disagree. Oh, here's a microphone for you. I would argue that um, there's insufficient evidence being gathered um, by only a an interview situation. Mm -hmm. Against what particular criteria? You might have got me on that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so pass the. Um, just from my point of view, I think it's um, reasonable. What I would say, if you actually go under assessment conditions, it's about regu uh, legislation regulations. So when you were speaking to them, you would really have to focus their complex documents. I think you can do it in an interview, but because of that, I would ask specific questions. It doesn't matter if Claire spent 10 hours reading it, as long as she got an understanding. So I would go to the complex documents to see if she'd got that understanding, but absolutely could be covered by interview. And your next door neighbour? Yeah. yeah, just I'm not looking at that at the moment, but the foundation skills talk about interpersonal and communication skills, which are there needs to be contingency questions then related to those situations in the foundation skills there, mm -hmm. or where it says that they have to talk you know, to different people. But they could be done with third party or collegial mm -hmm. um, to do with the workplace supervisor at mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. It's easily collected. Okay. So we, I also had a discussion with the middle group where we talked about some other things that we would like to check. <coughs> we were talking about the workplace. Do you want to talk about that? At the time, we were actually looking at the second unit um, where we were seeing a little bit of writing required mm -hmm. and we were wanting to check with the workplace about the types of forms that they used and the extent of the writing that was really expected, whether it was just a ticker box type form, yep. collating forms, or whether it was actually an expectation that there'd need to be something more written down. Um, yeah, so that was, that was in relation to the second one. In the first one, we didn't see that there necessarily would be, but I suppose you would still want to check with the workplace that that wasn't the case. Yes. To, you know, although it doesn't say it in the unit, there may be an expectation in the workplace that... Um, something is going to be written down in that leadership role. That's right. And remember when we talk about the workplace with uh, adjustment and issuing a nationally recognised qualification, we're not talking about one employer. <coughs> so this employer clearly values this person in the workplace. Clearly values this person. And they might have adjusted their operations in a way specifically for her that might actually be quite unreasonable in other workplaces. So potentially this is going to be fine, but there are some questions that we would certainly need to have answered before we actually gave this the final tick of approval. And, and I guess the, the point of looking at it like this is also to say what on the surface might look fine and quite reasonable when you actually delve into the detail of these questions, you might make a different decision about it. You might also say, it's fine and that's what we're going to do. But you do need to have a good look at what it is that you're proposing against the unit of competency and whether it is still reflective of industry standard, not employer standard. So hang on, we'll just get you a microphone. Sorry, we actually looked at it through um, the principles of assessment as well, yeah. and we thought that if you gave her that first one about the portfolios, we certainly um, it wouldn't be a valid way to assess her knowledge, and it wouldn't be fair um, or reason, you know, it wouldn't be fair or flexible. But 
by adjusting it, we've got to look at the reliability, and that's yeah. where the, the issue is. So by adjusting it, we've met those first three principles of assessment, but we could be a bit dodgy on the, on the other one. Exactly. And that's why you have to validate what it is you're going to do before you use it. So in, the, in exactly the same way that any assessment tool that you develop, you would validate it pre-use to make sure it looked like it was going to meet the principles of assessment and the rules of evidence, you would do the same for whatever it was that you had adjusted as well. And that's the, the activity that you're putting in place really to address standard 1.8, the requirements in there. Okay, what about the second unit of competency, implement continuous improvement? Have you got a table that would like to volunteer to talk about that one? I'm not seeing any hands pop up. We've only got a few minutes left, so I'm going to delegate. <laughs> Here we are. Thank you. Uh, we got with a no for um, two. Uh, the unit of competence right the way through asks for written... Um, reports, it asks for all sorts of things to be written down um, and she's just not capable of doing that at an mm. interview stage. Mm. Um, so it's really um, not, doesn't meet any of the rules and evidence at all. Okay. Agree or disagree? Agree. Anyone disagree? <laughs> yes? Um, we didn't actually disagree. We do agree that it's a no, but we yeah. felt it was more about that that um, approach wouldn't give the opportunity to provide all of the evidence required. So it's not that she couldn't do any of it, um, but we felt there would be elements though where she might struggle to provide strong enough evidence. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what about the discussion we had here? So yeah. can we just pop the microphone here? Um, I asked Claire the question um, as to whether... Claire could type because it just says she's not very good at writing um, and very few people handwrite these days so Claire said yes she can type and I went well what's the problem so so she could actually you could use um, the interview as part of the assessment because she's obviously more comfortable speaking and maybe have all the information at her fingertips, but you could ask for written, not written, but typed work, that she could be able to still produce the work documentation required, but she might just have to type it. Yeah. Um, but even if the typing was issued because she sort of couldn't spell or couldn't sort of, you know, use correct, you know, grammar or, or write it in that way, she could still possibly perhaps use voice-to-speech yes. yes. technology. Yes, yes. that's right. So there's all kinds of adaptive technologies that are available uh, these days that might in fact enable that outcome. And then again, this is where we come back to thinking about what's actually available in the workplace and what will work in the workplace. So on the surface of it, I would agree that we have... That adjustment on the journey too. So if we're doing the first module before this one, then we can look at foundation skills, mini, mini units about workplace documentation, yeah. reading and writing for those. Before so could, we get to the second year. You could build. Unit. Yeah. So, I've completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> On the surface, we would say no. <coughs> but when we dig down into it, again, potentially, it could be yes. And so hopefully the importance of that consultation process is clear when you start asking these questions and thinking about these <coughs> things. You have to consult with the learner. You have to consult with the book workplace to truly understand what is possible in terms uh, of adjustment. The idea of you having that um, process checklist is that you can take that away with you and start to think about how that might be used uh, in your organisation. If I think um, Yvette, I might just ask, is it possible for us to make a word copy available to people with the resources? Awesome. Okay, so you also have, um, and I've mentioned a few times already, a number of links that might be useful to you in terms of um, finding out information or more information about reasonable adjustment. So you have the department's book, it has a lot of information in it, you've got the disability standards themselves. Um, the publication from Queensland is a great publication and they have a lot of supporting fact sheets that go with that. 
Um, and, of course, you have your RTO standards, but Google search reasonable, adju reasonable adjustment and you'll be amazed at what actually appears for you. So, again, this PowerPoint, I think, is a, will be available to for people to access after the session. So, we have a few minutes left. Are there any questions or comments that you would like to ask at this stage? about a reasonable adjustment in the written word when yeah. we've got units like these which are a lot more cut and dry than when you've got to put it into a practical yes. sense. So it yes. beca the decision becomes much more difficult. Do you have some tips around that when you have to make something or have to create? Or, um, yeah. What are the, sort of the boundaries of reasonable adjustment around that? Mm -hmm. and this is um, a lot where the workplace comes into it. Because often the adjustment in terms of practical tasks, for example, if you have to use an electronic sander or, um, it, you know, there's some kind of um, physical capacity that has to be undertaken. So, for example, you might have to be able to restrain somebody or something like that. Or, you know, maybe you have cerebral palsy and it affects your hands and uh, you want to be a barista and you've got hot milk that you are trying to froth. In all of those situations, it's having a look, it's really having a look at what adjustments are possible and reasonable in the workplace because that's where that ultimately ends up. Now, sometimes there might be technologies available that might help that, but it won't allow you to meet the workplace standard. And all, well, pretty much all of our units of competency have some kind of requirement in there to meet the workplace standard. So in many cases with practical tasks, I think that consultation with the workplace will give you the best information about what's possible and what's not possible, and potentially accessing our industry. <laughs> yeah, that's where it gets tricky. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Okay. Hi, Claire. We've got a question from our webinar group uh, from Darren Roxburgh. If reasonable adjustment is possible, but the cost to implement is material for the RTO, yeah. can an RTO ask the student to cover the cost? Um, <coughs> that could be part of the agreement that you have with the student. There is a provision um, in the legislation for something called unjustifiable hardship. And that is where you can say no to an adjustment where the cost of implementing that adjustment is unreasonable or is unjustifiable for the organisation uh, or the individual or the workplace. And one more from Central Regional TAFE Kalgoorlie Campus. Do alternative assessment methods have to be made available to all candidates? Uh, I think I need some more information on that one. As in, is it, if you're going to make an adjustment, would you make that available to everybody? Or is that what they're asking? So, um, yes. That is what they're asking? No. So, the, when you have a look at the standards for RTOs, there's a few things that impact there. So, the first thing is it, it says that you put a strategy in place that suits the needs of your client group. And then it says you tell your client group what you are going to do so that they can make an informed choice about whether they participate that in not or not. Now you might have an individual who looks at that and says well that's not going to work for me and can we do this in which case you would go through this type of, of process. So if you put in the marketing material to the participants that uh, you're able to adjust um, to meet their needs then I would say yes. If you put in the marketing material that you will only adjust in certain circumstances and it will be on a case-by-case -case basis, then I would say no. Okay, so there's been quite a bit of information that's been provided to you or you pointed at today. I hope you take the time to uh, 
go away and, and spend a bit of time reading that information and then I'll look forward to seeing lots of reasonable adjustment rather than unreasonable adjustment when I visit you with a different hat on. So thank you for today.